<laughs> your election was an interesting election, and you haven't spoken about it. Your election to the House of Representatives in Massachusetts, yeah. uh, where they thought that your opponent, Mr. Lopresti, was going to win. Well, that's and Congress. You that, that was the Congress. That was fight. the congressional that's, seat. That, okay. That's a sad fight in, in retrospect. As you look back, it was an Irish Italian fight, to be perfectly truthful. And what happened in the, the district was about 35% uh, Irish, about 35% Italian. Uh, blacks and uh, 50 nationalities made up the other group. And he got the Italians 95% uh, and I got 95% of the Irish. And I got the, the uh, majority of yep. the, other, the others. Well, you've always, mm -hmm. I, uh, ever since I was aware of you, I've been voting for you, so yeah, I'm... Darling, been, I voted for you for governor. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back I, a little... But, I want, but you started, the first time you got elected, you got elected to the uh, school committee. Massachusetts. Right? No, 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 that's another story. No, the answer, I, I, when yeah. I was a, a senior at Boston College in 1936, I was 22 years old, I ran for the city council. That's at large, there yeah. were 60 right. ran, eight were nominated, and I finished ninth. And now nobody gave me a chance, a, a kid in college, yeah. and I'm speaking at every street corner, and I came up with the craziest platform you ever had. Uh, I wanted tax breaks for every company, Lever Brothers and everybody else that hired Cambridge people. We gave them a tax reduction, unconstitutional, but I wasn't <laughs> smart enough to appreciate it at a particular time, see? But anyway, everything was street corner rallies. You'd get your permit, and, and it, was, it was great politics. And I had been very, very active, you know, with the Democratic Party and then the young Democrats. And I surprised everybody. Uh, Johnny Toomey finished eighth, and I finished ninth, and then Johnny went on to win. And uh, the uh, Cambridge paper, I'll never forget him, Bill Conway, he ran, wrote the old Rambler. He says, new star on Cambridge Horizon, 22-year-old boy, big surprise. Like, in the first nine, the, we were all close together. And then everybody else was, the, the next 50 were way behind. You know how those things go. So the next year, I ran for the state legislature, 1936, and I got elected to the state legislature. You served in a triple district with John J. Foley and James F. Mahoney in your Jim Mahoney team. was the popular man. Then, the, then so I said. So what was your district there? We had uh, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Seven, seven, eight, mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine. So ten. you I had Cambridge, with, uh, Mass. Judge Jeremiah Sullivan and Walter yeah. Sullivan. They well, were also well, Walter wasn't in the same district with me, but Jerry and I had double districts. Yeah, they changed the districts then. At one time, you served in the North Cambridge district with a Democratic colleague. Uh, Jerry, Jerry Sullivan. Jerry Sullivan. Sure, the, mid, the mid Cambridge district, however, was three solid Republicans. You right. Had, uh, uh, such. Uh, well, there was Henry no, no, Winslow. No. There was Dana Gallup. There was Haven Parker, Lindy Lindstrom. They all. John Serino. John Serino. Yeah. What kind of relationship did you have with the Republicans from mid? Cambridge? Oh, we never had any problems. You know. Uh, did they ever vote with you? Well, in the early days, uh, the answer was no. Very interestingly. <laughs> In 1900, in 1976, uh, no, no, 1900 and, uh, what am I talking about? 1948, uh, I went to see John McCormick. I had never met him. He's the leader of the House. And I'm the Democratic minority leader. Jimmy Gibb thought, he said, of making the House Democratic. <laughs> and I laughed, you know. The House is 140, 160 Democrat Republicans and 80 Democrats, two to one. The 240 member House at that time. Yeah, two parties. So I came back, and Tom Mullen, who was my administrative assistant, said, what did the old goat have to say? <laughs> well, I said, well, the same thing, you know. You ever give thought to make on the House Democratic? So uh, about two weeks later, Tom Mullen said, 1942 or 44, Morris Tobin was elected governor. He said, if we had had a candidate running and carried every district that Morris Tobin carried, he said he carried 136 districts. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So uh, I went back to see my comic, and uh, I said, I'm giving that some thought. But I said, you know, the elements of politics, you got to need the money. And the first, he said, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do, he said. Uh, how much is your budget? I said, $40,000. He said, I'll give you, I'll raise you 20000 you raise 20000 
I said, all right, we'll try it. And the first funding he got was uh, the head of the orchestras, the Musicians' Union. I can't think of his name. He was a great liberal. Jeez, he gave us $7,500. And when I got $7,500 from him, I got frightened. I had never seen that kind of money in the world. And he had this union sending it and that union sending it. And then uh, Deva gave and Kennedy gave and uh, my family gave. And we raised money and we had outings and everything else. We went out and we got 40 candidates to run for Congress, uh, for state legislature. Well, everything happens. Right to life is on the ballot with Cardinal Cushing spending oh. $100,000. Right to work is on the ballot and labor for the only time in its life is waking up and shaking. Truman is on the ballot and he's extremely popular. And Dever is on the ballot and he's extremely popular. And I get 40 new members who are young lawyers and business people. You just get out of war. Nobody knows who you are. You're a lawyer. This is a chance to ring the doorbell, tell them you're a lawyer. And geez, if we don't win with 38 out of 40 of them. And I wake up a Speaker of the House, 122 to 118. And it was all because McCormick set the flame, but it, it was Tom Mullen. And it still years before the Senate went Democratic. Well, uh, no, the Senate the went even that year. Well, they went 50-50. Went, went then uh, then we lost it. We, then I was uh, in the House for four years as Speaker, first Democrat. Then went back to uh, Charlie Gibbons for two years, and then Mike Scarry, and they've never had one since. One of your House colleagues from a different Cambridge district in 1951. And my 52. pal was Lindstrom. He was a Republican. He was my closest pal. Well, he shared the district with Walter Sullivan, who was right. in the House of right. Representatives right. at that time. Right. Uh, Lindy Lindstrom is somebody about whom Mary Newman spoke very highly as well. Uh, oh, great guy. A wonderful guy. You speak very highly of a lot of Republicans. Well, yeah, well you know, he was a very... Uh, well, he was a close personal friend, and he a big man on the Elks in Cambridge. And, uh, well, you know, I got elected Speaker of the House by four votes. And actually, it was well known that the Republicans are very much upset. And if uh, you would take a walk, I think they pay you $500 or 1000 or 2000 And if you had the guts to vote for the, for the Republican candidate, uh, I think it was, I forget who it was. I, I guess it was uh, Charlie Gibbons. I, uh, they'd pay you a certain sum. There's no question about that. They were out there, they didn't want to lose the house. And I had a couple of fellows, uh, Lindy. Lindy said to me, hey, you want it fair and square. If there's any Republican turns and votes against you, I'll, I'm going to vote for you. John Vaughn from Arlington, uh, from Belmont, was the same way. Hey, you want it fair and square. You know, people say to me, if, uh, supposing uh, you're a delegate, uh, or you're in the Congress of the United States, and uh, uh, somebody other than a Democrat wins the state, and it's thrown into the thing, I says, you vote the will of your district. You don't vote your party, you vote the will of your district. I think you're right. So in other words, if Perot takes Massachusetts, and if it goes uh, into the House, you think you would then feel you had to no vote? No question about it. Yeah. That's the, the Congress responds to the will of the American people. You know, the people say, Congress is in terrible shape. Why are they in terrible shape? Because they, really, they haven't shown enough guts and courage because they respond to the will of the American people. Why do we get all of these programs out there? Because the American people want the programs. Try to do away with them. They show you how tough it is. Right. Can I ask you about one historical figure? You, me you mentioned him, and I was curious. He's dead about 25 years now was Cardinal Cushing. In, in that era, I mean, maybe Catholics were kind of coming into an ascendancy, but did you know him well? What was he like? Well, uh, he was loved, as a matter of fact. He was probably the only clergyman that I ever saw who uh, would walk down the street. Uh, there would be a Roosevelt. Uh, he, he was a man with a, a Babe Ruth. He was a man with charisma. He would walk down the street and people would follow him. He was a man of charisma. Did I know him well? The answer is no. I, uh, I have never known any of them well. I've always kept, uh, I'm a practicing Catholic. I think I do a good job, but I don't wear it on my sleeve, and I have never been slow, closely connected with the hierarchy. While you were in the legislature, you also served a term on the Cambridge School Committee, didn't you? Right. How did that come about? <laughs> That's a funny story. Uh, they wanted to fire John, John Tobin as the uh, 
superintendent of schools? As the superintendent of schools. That, it, was that Danahy's well, uncle, Tom Danahy's Dana, uncle? Tom Danahy's... Tom no, Danahy's... No, he wasn't related to him, but what had happened oh, was... Oh, no, 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 no. Tom Danahy... That was John D. Lynch. No, John D. Lynch's sister. Oh, I see. John D. Lynch's sister was Danahy's wife. And the school uh, committee had, had canceled the search and voted Tobin superintendent in 1945. So there was an effort to get him in 46, 47, and 48. Oh, they, let's see. Now, they had a, you're a little off, Glenn. It was in the 30s that John Tobin was elected school committee man. This is an unbelievable story. I'm talking to my wife and my daughter, Rosemary and Susan, about the new book, and they said, you ought to put something like this in it. People can't believe it. John Tobin became elected president of the United States. His father was Dan Tobin, who was the head of the Teamsters Union. You remember the great phallus speech? You know, at the Teamsters Union, uh, Roosevelt said, I don't mind them. Uh, Rose, uh, Eleanor doesn't complain, and I don't complain. And this one, Jimmy doesn't complain, but poor Falla complains, and it stole the American. It was, it was just a tremendous speech. It was at the Teamsters. Now, the Teamsters in those days were Democrats. And uh, John Tobin, Dan Tobin was the president. And John, John Tobin's father was, huh? was, John Tobin's father was Dan Tobin? John Tobin's father was Dan Tobin, president of the uh, Teamsters. And John Tobin wants to become superintendent of schools in Cambridge. This is a hard story to, to believe. It's almost, <laughs> President Roosevelt called Jack Delaney, was a member of the board and asked him to put him on to vote for him. Jack Delaney gets a job as head of the Lawrence Bank. The banks had gone under. And he's the administrator of the bank. Uh, Ralph Robot is the chairman of uh, Weights and Measures. He's a Republican. Ely had been elected. I think it was Ely, or maybe it was Curley. The president of the United States called the governor to keep Ely on the job if Ely would vote for John Tobin. <laughs> <laughs> it's un unbelievable. My, <laughs> Millie and my daughter say, I can't believe that there was the president of the United States would be involved in a superintendent of schools fight. Foley was his neighbor, and uh, I forget who the other vote was, and they elected John Tobin as superintendent of schools. Now, John Tobin was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy. His nickname was Knowledge Tobin. Well, uh, there were those uh, from the Harvard School of Education who always were, they were, against him. were against him, and they didn't like the way he handled the school. And the majority of the women were against him because he was a chauvinist all the way. And uh, anyway, uh, the school committee, Billy Brooks, goes to war. Uh, Billy Brooks' father was mayor. His mother was on the school committee for years, and Billy's on the school committee. Died only recently. And uh, he goes to war, so it leaves a vacancy. And somebody else goes to war, and it leaves a vacancy. And Jerry Sullivan and I are called up to the parish house, Monsignor Blunt. And he said, uh, Harvard people want to take over the school committee, want to fire John Tobin. He says, either you or Jerry Sullivan is going to have to run to control this to get a seat because you can get a, you both here can get elected. And we're both members of the state legislature. And I said, well, I'm not interested. And Jerry says, I'm not interested. And he said, I'm going to tell you, either one of you fellows are going to run because you can win and you're going to save that seat for Tobin or I'm going to denounce you from the altar. <laughs> so Jerry and I look at each other. And we flipped a coin, and I lost. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I happened to run for school committee, <laughs> to save John Tobin's job. <laughs> we, and the, and the interesting thing about it, we had the, we had the great uh, study at that particular time, the Simpson study. Right. That was a Harvard study. Uh, By Simpson. Professor Simpson of Harvard yes. University. Yes. <laughs> it was the Simpson study. <laughs> I know. Was, was Simpson, was, uh, was he a dean of the... He uh, was a, he, the dean of the Ed School. Yeah. And was, uh, well, anyway, he came out with the report, and I'll never forget the report. Dewey Almey, uh, Bradley, Bradley Dewey, Dewey was the chief man against, mm -hmm. against uh, t firing Tobin. But anyway, to make, make a long story short, we met 88 days. How would you like to meet 88 oh. summer days on the hearing of Tobin? 
and the study that had made. And the thing was just unbelievable. Tobin was so brilliant. The story that the, the, the investigation in Philadelphia, the fellow that had done the investigation at, for Cambridge, took verbatim 50 pages out and he got paid by, by the Harvard University group for submitting his part. And Tobin had it all turned out to get up the phone and say, Jews, write this. Yeah, yeah, I wrote down. Let me read page, read page so and so, and read page so and so, read page. Now, uh, I want you to read the report of uh, <laughs> Philadelphia's study that was made by <laughs> Professor So-and-so. Would you be kind enough to read that? Okay, now read page one again of your own. And it was identical, see? And Tobin had a, he was a brilliant, brilliant mind, but uh, two years on the school committee and I was happy to get off there. If, 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 if history was to write you. And, and let me say, I know of no clergyman today with any type of power in any denomination. Okay. Well, those days are all well gone by, you know. Well, if I, ca I couldn't to imagine a pastor to... calling me today yeah. and telling me I'm, I'm going to denounce yeah, you from the it. elder. Well, I'll, I'll well, say you me... were right about one thing you said, which was that John Tobin. Was Honey, I'm right about everything I said. <laughs> 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 well, uh, he was he was a very bright man. He didn't like working with women. That's that, right. That's yeah. for sure about yeah. John Tobin. The jo now he has a school named after him, and he did a lot of good for the schools. But I was in the party that was on the other side at that time. But he won. He hung in there until he decided to retire. Yeah, but the interesting part, yeah, he hung in there. But the interesting part was how he won the election. It is. <laughs> it's inconceivable to think that the president of the United States. <laughs> well, they reached and in those out. They days, had long those off. days, nobody reported anything. Everybody yeah. in everybody in the Boston area knew that Jack, yeah. how Jack Delaney got the job of the head of the Lawrence Bank. They knew how Colonel Robot kept the job as, as, as head of sailors and weights and measures. Yeah. It was just that's politics. Well, after, after such a brilliant career of your own, uh, if people were to write you um, in history, how would you like to be remembered? Well, I thought you was a very, and I still do think you're a very brilliant politician. You've had certainly a marvelous career. Well, I, 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 I'm happy with the accomplishments I made, to be perfectly truthful. You know, uh, I don't know how many times I've spelled it out, but 50% uh, of America when I was a kid uh, un uh, in poverty, 25% unemployed, 3% graduating from high school to go to college, 8% with pensions, 5% with, with, uh, with uh, insurance. Uh, I get sick when I think of 36 million people still without insurance. But... Uh, played a part in, in the development of middle America. When I think of the things that I, uh, I received an award not too long ago, Biometric Association of America or something like that, and they call me and they, I'm still offered awards. And they, hey, an award is a day out of my life, to be perfectly truthful. But anyway, I decided that I'd go down. I was on a watch, and I'd go to this biotech thing. And who's there but DeBasey, Dr. DeBasey. And I said, Doc, why am I receiving an award? I said, I'm five years out of Congress. Well, he said, well, let me tell you, he says, uh, a lot of important people here receiving the award tonight. I says, yeah. He said, uh, I'm going to introduce you. And he said, I'll tell you why you're receiving the award. And he got up and he said, the year is about 1974. O'Neill is the majority leader of the Congress. And he said, I went to see him with people from the uh, Dana-Farber, people from the Children's Hospital, people from Case University, Stanford Hospital, <coughs> Texas hospitals. And he said, we went in and we wanted $50 million for dwarfs. And he said, I can remember, he said, the editorial in the New York Times said, look at all the Cuban heels you could buy for $50 million. Well, he says, that's uh, almost 20 years ago now. He said, I'm here to tell you, he says, that we can find a dwarf in a the, in the mother's womb or a year and a half be when it's born. It's as weak, and because of the process of the $50 million and the study that we've made, we can grow that human being. And 8,000 are born a year, we can grow that human being.
to normal height. That's wonderful. And he said, uh, here's the man, he said, that put it in. He says he put in $17 million for knock knees and $25 million for turned in ankles. Little do you realize, he said, that 50 years ago or 40 years ago, he said, uh, seven out of every 10 children were born with a defect. And he mm -hmm. says, now we know how to cure them right from birth. And uh, I started to cry, to be perfectly mm -hmm. truthful. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, things are turned. I, I, I couldn't walk over to the committee today and say, hey, I want $200 million in that budget for cancer, as I did with Mary Alaska. We put $160 million in one afternoon for cancer and $50 million in for, for breast cancer in one day. Couldn't do it today. The whole politics has changed. There isn't the power. Foley doesn't have the power that I had when I was majority leader. But your children and grandchildren will look with great pride on many terrific accomplishments of yours. But one other thing that's not insignificant, we've talked about Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and look at the way Dukakis went out. You're a rare example of someone who left when you felt like it, walked out on top with your head high and are as popular today as you ever were. That's as rare in politics as anything else. Well, thank you, Tommy. <laughs> I can tell you, though, I enjoyed 50 years of it. I really did. You have another book in the works. We have, yeah. Uh, uh, my old uh, press secretary, uh, Gary Hamel, and I, uh, we're going to work on a primer of politics and uh, try to tell her what politics is all about, how you get elected. Will there be a lot um, of anecdotes? I ain't real life well, it's going to be a small book, paperback. I'm only telling you what my agent wants out there and uh, we're going to labor on it but the interesting thing about it I got out a recording my daughter Rosemary last Labor Day said you and Leo Deal have been singing songs Irish songs <laughs> political songs for 60 years she said why don't you do a tape and uh, leave them to your grandchildren so they'll have them no okay we're down in Florida and uh, he meets the Lacantos, who were originally from Cambridge, the Lacanto brothers. They were good singers. They were with RCA for 17 years. They were on the old, uh, oh, I can't think of the show. But anyway, they had a golden record called Sipton Cider Through a Straw on Mary Ann. Sure. Yeah, I don't know any of you old enough for that. But anyway, they said, come on over to the studio and we'll do the rehearsal. So we go over to the studio. And over at the studio, uh, Leo and I sing the song and he Pats it in with the piano. And we spent about eight hours. And after we had it all, said, geez, isn't that awful? Isn't that <laughs> terrible? Now he puts a band in behind it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't believe it. I can't believe it's the same people. <laughs> but I have uh, a couple of uh, little poems in there. Uh, when I've been, and, that, and then I tell a story about going to the Curly's house and Curly saying, me, I'm going to give you 10, which is in the book, I'm going to give you uh, uh, Ten pieces to remember, and you'll never again, never falter, or you'll never be at a, a spot where you're lost for words. And so, uh, around the corner, I had a friend in this great city that has no end. And the grades go by, and the weeks go on, and before you know it, a year is gone. I haven't seen my old friend's face, for life is a swift and terrible race. He knows I love him just as well as in the days when I rang his bell and he rang mine. We were younger then. But now we're tired and busy men and tired of trying to make a name and tired of trying to play the game. Tomorrow comes and tomorrow goes and the distance between us grows and grows. Around the corner yet miles away, here's a telegram, sir. Jim died today and that's what you get and deserve in the end. Around the corner, a vanished friend. Well, today I met with 20 of my old pals from the original Barry Gang. I think the youngest was 76 and the oldest was 86. And there's 20 of us left, and we talked about old times in North Cambridge, and we talked about Moorsies and Jerry's Pits and Foley's and the old North Cambridge ba baseball team of uh, Guttrow and Gaspipe Solomon and Jay O'Connor. And, and we Jeez talked about cream. Ridge Park, and we talked about the the nursery down behind there, and we talked about the pottery fire, and it just, we went down the valley of dreams, and boy, we really enjoyed it. And so uh, we agree that a year from today, we'll be back together again, and I'm delighted to be with you, Peter. We appreciate we your sharing you. your thoughts Enjoy. and memories with thank us. You. Speaker O'Neill, thanks for being with us, and we'll see thank you again you, on Cambridge Inside Out.